Hey there, I'm Rylan from Temporal, and I'm here to bring you the second video in the series that I recently started, which is just covering anything in the Temporal universe. In the first video, we started out super duper simple. Um, we, you know, covered the basics of writing workflows, and we wrote a Hello World workflow that, uh, you know, called a single activity, um, taking a string parameter and returned it back to the user doing some basic concatenation. Uh, we also covered concepts like the starter and the worker, um, which are really critical for writing any sort of you know, real temporal application. In this video, we're actually going to be focusing um, a little bit less on the code side of things, although we will be making some small changes there. Uh, and we're actually going to be focusing more on temporal web. Um, temporal web is an application that we provide as well in the open source. Um, if you're using the Docker Compose setup, it's set up automatically for you when you, when you start Docker, uh, and it's always available on um, port 8088 on your local host. Um, if you're using the standalone server binary, you will need to run Temporal Web separately. And uh, Temporal Web is, in general, a great way to get insight into your running Temporal application and really understand exactly what's happening with a given workflow or an activity. Um, so if things start to go wrong, uh, usually the first place you'll look is Temporal Web to see if there's something that's super duper obvious um, that's, that's happened and um, can tell you exactly what you need to do to fix your problem. Uh, and so I'm going to go and tab over to my terminal. Uh, we'll be continuing using the exact example that we wrote in the first tutorial, the basic hello world. Um, as I said initially, we won't be doing that many code changes. Um, we'll mostly just be making some changes to kind of showcase what's possible with the web UI. So to get started, uh, we're going to actually do something a little bit interesting. Um, if you remember in the first video, we covered the concepts of the worker and the starter. So um, to quickly recap, the worker is the actual process which hosts your workflow and activity code. Um, the temporal service itself never sees your code. It doesn't actually run any code. Um, and so you do need these workers running that have um, you know, the ability to call the temporal service and get tasks for those given workflow and activity implementations so it can actually run them. Uh, and then the second thing we covered was the starter, which is essentially a very small program, which is special purpose just to kick off your workflow. Uh, and as I said before, this isn't strictly speaking required because you could always use a direct gRPC request or use our CLI, um, but in most cases you wanna have the starter. And so the relevance of talking about this now is that we're actually gonna do something a bit interesting uh, and we're gonna run our starter program for this Hello World workflow um, without having a worker running. Uh, and so as we said, you know, there's an expectation that if there's no worker that has your workflow and activity implementation, um, no forward progress can actually be made on your workflows. Uh, and so as we can see, we ran the starter. Um, we do get this log output that kind of tells us that, you know, it's, it is working, um, but we see that it hasn't finished, it hasn't completed. Uh, and that's because if we go and look at our starter implementation and we look at line 29 over here, um, we can see that we're basically blocking and, and we're waiting for this workflow execution to finish and give a result back before we move forward. Uh, and so this makes sense because again, we don't have any worker running, so there's no way for the workflow to make forward progress. Um, but let's say that we, we didn't do this on purpose and we wanted to know what was going on. Awesome. So as you can see, we're back in the temporal web UI. Um, but there's not actually anything on the screen. So unfortunately, as of today, there's no sort of hot reloading mechanism for the web. Uh, and so we actually have to manually refresh. Um, but once we do, we can see that there has been some information populated on the screen. Uh, and so for the first time, we'll just go over this uh, column by column so you know what to expect the next time you're looking at it. So the first thing we see is something called the workflow ID. So the workflow ID is an ID that you provide when you execute a workflow that allows you to kind of get back to that workflow execution instance um, you know, in the future if you wanna get the result from it or potentially send a signal or do other operations. Uh, and so this is something that again, you provide. Um, it does need to be unique for an uh, individual running workflow. So um, you, know, you can't have two workflows uh, running at the same time with the same ID. Uh, and we can actually validate that this is what we should see because if we look at line 19 in our starter program that we wrote in the last video, um, the ID we provided it was indeed hello workflow video. So makes sense. So the next column is something called run ID. Um, the run ID is something that you don't have to explicitly provide, although you can um, to the service when you execute a workflow, um, similar to the workflow ID. Uh, and the purpose of the run ID is to differentiate workflows that have run with the same workflow ID, um, but are different runs. So, you know, um, in the case of this workflow, if it were to complete, um, we would actually be able to start a new workflow with the same ID, um, because while you can't have two running at the same time with the same ID, um, you know, if one completes, by default, the policy allows you to start a new one with the same ID. And so the way that the system would differentiate between those two runs is with this run ID. Uh, 
So the next column is a name. Um, this one is pretty easy to understand. Uh, if we go to our workflow code and we actually look at the implementation, we can see that we called it workflow and that is why this says workflow here. So maybe a bit confusing because of the way we named it, but whatever you name it in your code, it will always show up here. So the next thing is called status. Um, this is something that you don't explicitly report yourself as a temporal user or developer. Uh, it's something that's sort of implicitly generated by the system as a workflow is running. Uh, and so, you know, the statuses that you're going to see reported here are pretty coarse grained. Um, for example, running, completed, um, terminated, but definitely not any sort of custom business level status that you would be able to set yourself. Then the last column of interest is start time. Uh, again, pretty self-explanatory. Um, as we can see, there is no end time here, which does make sense because we don't have a worker running our workflow code. So there's no way for the workflow to make forward progress. Uh, and so this is kind of the extent of the information we can get out of this screen. Uh, but maybe let's dive into you know, the specific workflow information um, for this instance and see what more we can learn. Awesome. So now we're in the per workflow instance page and you can tell that a lot of the information here is similar to what we saw on the summary screen in, in the past. Uh, there is some interesting new stuff here. So the first thing that kind of pops out is that there's this input field um, and the input is actually what you pass to the workflow execution when it was started, if it took in arguments. Um, so in our case with the hello world workflow, um, we did take in this string on line nine. Uh, and so if we look in our starter program, there should be some part of the code that kind of says audience. And as you can tell on line 23, um, this is where we're passing in the uh, audience, you know, variable, and it does correctly propagate to the workflow. So looks good. Now, the next thing is going to be a little less interesting to us now, but we should definitely check it out. So this is a page where you can see the task queues or basically the workers um, that are pulling for a given workflow uh, instance. Now, in our case, we didn't start the worker, so it makes sense that we don't see anything here, um, but this is a great place to kind of identify if there are problems with your workers that are running your workflows, um, because that can often be the reason why things aren't moving forward. And so the last thing on this page that's of interest is this history events. So in temporal, um, all stateful actions that happen within a workflow um, directly add events to the workflow's execution history. Um, the execution history is a log of all of the different changes in state that your workflow has had um, during its lifetime. And it's what allows the temporal system to be so resilient and so reliable um, because we're constantly communicating um, events to the persistence and adding them to the history. So if any sort of critical failure happens on your actual worker process, it doesn't really matter because the temporal can reconstruct it. So while knowing how many history events there are is so, sort of useful, it's actually a lot more interesting for us to dive into the history itself. So as we can see, um, there's, there's two events that show up on this screen. Um, we kind of expect this to happen because as we said, there is no worker that can actually process our workflow and make forward progress. Um, so there's no way for the, the code and the activity, for example, that's in that hello workflow to run. Uh, and so just to kind of briefly go over what we have on the screen, we see there's a workflow execution started event here. Um, that means that the system basically acknowledged that you wanted to execute the workflow when you when you ran it from your starter. Um, and so, you know, it got the input and it, and it then used this workflow task scheduled event to signal that it's put the task to run this workflow on one of the temporal internal task queues, um, which means that if there is a worker that can process it and is listening on this hello world task queue, uh, it can then pick up that task and run the, the code. Uh, and so this, this isn't happening, obviously, uh, and that's because we, we don't have a worker running. So maybe the next thing we can do is actually go back to our terminal uh, and we can go over to this other window in the top right that I have here. Um, and we can actually, uh, once I find my, my cursor, there we go. Uh, we can actually run the worker and hopefully there'll be two things that happen. So the first thing we expect to happen is that the starter program that's running in the terminal in the bottom right, um, it's going to unblock and finish because it's only waiting for this workflow execution. And hopefully once we run our worker, then we'll actually, you know, unblock it and it will be able to complete its execution. Uh, and so the second thing that we expect to happen is that if we go back to the temporal web UI after we run the worker, um, we should see a lot more events in the event history because the workflow should be able to make forward progress. So let's go ahead and do that. And awesome. Indeed, we see that the starter has been unblocked and we did get this result back of hello audience, which is exactly what we expect. Uh, and if we go over to this screen uh, and we refresh, because again, there's no hot reloading, uh, we can see there's a lot more events in the history. 
Uh, so the first thing we see that was added is there's this workflow task completed and this workflow task started. Um, that means that you know there was a worker that could process running the initial workflow code. Um, and so this event basically represents the code running from the you know line oops um, in the workflow from line 10 um, to line 19 where there's this workflow execution ha or this activity execution happening. Uh, and so that's why we see in um, event number five, there's this activity task scheduled because the worker then tells the temporal service, hey, uh, I have this activity that needs to run. Can you make sure that you schedule it so another worker, potentially me, but any other worker that can handle this code um, can pick it up and run it. So then we see that you know um, the activity task uh, did get actually picked up by the worker, the same worker uh, in this case, because there's only one. Uh, it ran that activity code um, and it completed the activity and actually returned this response of hello audience, which is again, um, exactly what we'd expect, line 29, that's what we want from our activity. Awesome. So then we see that you know um, basically we, we finished line 20, um, Temporal has persisted the result of that activity running. Uh, and so now we're on line 21, and which is once again in the workflow code. Uh, so we do indeed see this workflow task scheduled, which represents running the rest of the workflow code implementation. Um, the worker picks up that task, again, the same worker because there's only one. Um, it runs the remaining portion of the workflow's code uh, and then eventually signals back to the system that the workflow code has been completed. Uh, and in fact, it's not just the specific portion of the workflow's code, but the entire workflow uh, implementation, it's done. We've reached the end. Uh, and so that's why we see both this workflow task completed and this workflow execution completed event because they're they're both communicated at the same time. Uh, and as we can see, the workflow execution completed um, basically gives us the same response that we got from our starter program, um, which is hello audience, which again, makes a ton of sense. So this is a basic understanding of how you can kind of rely on the event history of your temporal workflows um, to get a lot of insights to exactly what happened and, and why it happened. Um, there's one more thing I want to cover for this specific, you know, kind of uh, scenario, uh, and that's just to go back to the stack trace screen um, and refresh. Oh, sorry, not stack trace, my bad. Uh, summary screen and go to the task queue. Um, and as we can see, this has changed because in the original, uh, th when we went here originally, there was actually no worker that could handle this workflow and activity implementation. Uh, but since we started that worker, there was a, a, a worker who could pull on that task queue, and so we do see it represented in this screen now. Going to go back here, set it to open because usually you don't care about all the ones that have run in the past. Uh, and we're going to go to our next scenario. All right, so for the next scenario, uh, we're actually going to jump back to our code. Um, we're going to make one very small change here. We're actually going to um, sleep in our activity. Uh, and I want to call out explicitly here because I think it's pretty important that the only reason that we can actually use the Golang native sleep here is because we're doing this in activity and not a workflow. Otherwise, you'd have to use the temporal specific sleep to guarantee determinism. Um, so we're going to sleep, let's just say, for 30 seconds. And I'm hoping that's going to be enough time for me to show what I want to show. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and you know just sleep and then return the exact same thing that we were doing before. Uh, and we're going to go ahead. We have the worker running. We're not going to change that. We actually, sorry, we do need to restart the worker because we made changes to our workflow code and there's no hot reloading for workers. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and run our starter again. Once we have our starter running, we're going to jump back over to Temporal Web UI. We're going to refresh uh, and we're going to go and click on this run ID for this workflow once again. And we're now going to go to this page that we hadn't gone to before, which is called stack trace. So what the stack trace page does is literally show you a stack trace of where your workflow execution is currently blocked on. Um, sometimes this can be for reasons that you expect and sometimes it can be for reasons that you don't expect. So it's both useful for the visibility side of things and also the debugging side of things. Um, and as we can see, the, the code is actually blocked um, exactly where we would expect. Um, it's blocked where we started our activity execution because you know that's the last thing we did, uh, workflow.go line 20. Um, and you know the work or the activity implementation is um, is sleeping right now. So there's basically no forward progress being made until that 30 seconds is up. Um, although I'm sure if we refresh at this point, we will see that you know or maybe go to the summary uh, and refresh. We can see that the workflow is now completed. Uh, and so this is just a very quick example of how you can use the stack trace page to get a really a deep understanding of where exactly in your code your workflow is having issues or you know just doing its job correctly. Uh, and it's something that I rely on a lot personally. So for the next scenario, we're actually going to go back to our code uh, and we're gonna remove this call to time.sleep um, because we don't need that anymore. 
And what we're actually going to do is explicitly throw an error from an, our, our activity. So it keeps failing and the workflow can't make forward progress. And then basically learn how to visually inspect this using the temporal web UI um, and hot fix it without having to like restart your workflow entirely. So the first thing we're going to need to do is import, import a new package uh, into our workflow. So we're going to need SDK forward slash temporal. And the reason we need this is because when you return an error from an activity in Temporal, um, you don't want to use the default error type. You want to use um, a special type of error um, that Temporal package provides. And so we're going to go ahead and do that, um, provide an empty string because we don't really care. It's going to be an error. Uh, and then we're going to do temporal.newApplicationError. Uh, and it takes in a, a message, which is a string, an error type, which is also a string, and then some uh, details. So we're going to go ahead and say, mm. We don't really care and we'll say nil because we also don't care. Uh, actually, we do care about the message. So let's say um, something didn't work, right? Very, very helpful message for an error. Uh, and so this is all we need to actually change here. We will need to restart our worker. Um, unfortunately, there's no sort of hot reloading mechanism for workers either. So we have to you know, restart that anytime we change our code. Um, and so then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and run our starter. Uh, and we'll, we'll tab back over to the temporal web. Um, we'll go to the list screen and make sure that we're only listing open workflows. Um, we'll go into the you know, uh, workflow summary page for this workflow that we just ran. Uh, and we can see that there's five history events, right? So it's a much different state that we entered in that, that first workflow example we showed, um, but it's still not, not completed, right? And this thing should finish very, very quickly. So something's happening. And so even before going into the history, we can actually see quite a bit of information here. We see there's um, pending activities. Um, specifically, you know, there's this activity which has a state of pending activity state scheduled. Uh, and there's even been five attempts to retry this activity. Um, and we see that the last failure failed with something didn't work. Uh, and so obviously this is because we are explicitly returning an error from an our, our activity. Um, but let's go see if the, the workflow history can kind of confirm that. And so we see that, you know, we got past this initial workflow execution started and workflow task scheduled event that, you know, the workflow was blocked on when there was no worker. Um, and we did get to the point where we actually, you know, scheduled this activity to run, but it seems like the activity is never officially started or completed. Uh, and so wh why is this happening? Um, well, the answer is obviously this error that we put in the code. Uh, and so, you know, most of the time, things aren't this easy to kind of discover if there's an issue like this. Um, but in this case, let's assume that we're, we knew exactly you know, why this, this went wrong. Well, the nice thing about Temporal is that fixing a problem like this is very, very lightweight. Um, all we need to do is literally remove this line of code, um, uncomment have the, the better implementation, um, and then restart our worker. And so the moment that we do this, um, what we should see, oops, um, now I'm no longer using this library, so I'm going to get rid of that. Awesome. So now that we restart our worker, uh, we should see the starter program actually complete um, quite, quite quickly. Um, the one reason that it's going to take a little bit longer is because by default, activities use exponential back off for their retries. And so we were retrying quite a few times with this workflow, um, at least five the last time we checked, eight last time we checked. And so the actual back off time is going to be quite high at this point. And so we might have put ourselves into a bit of an interesting situation where we have to wait a few seconds before the um, worker can actually retry this activity again uh, and, and have it succeed because obviously it will succeed this time. Um, and so as we can see, I just refreshed again. Um, the workflow was able to make forward progress because the activity was able to you know, actually succeed and complete and report a, a status back to the, the service. Um, and so we can see that we do now get the correct result of, of Hello Audience. Uh, and so the one last thing I want to cover here because it's, it's really important to understand is that it was very easy for us to make this hotfix to the activity implementation um, because activities are not expected to be deterministic. Um, if you had a bug of this degree in your workflow code, um, you often need to be very aware of how it affects the determinism of the workflow code um, because in a lot of cases, you're not able to just hotfix it as casually. You will need to use our versioning feature or potentially even you know, kind of spin down those workflows and bring up new ones um, with the new implementation. So I think that's a great start to some of the high level debugging and information that you can get out of the temporal web UI. Um, there's a lot more to it and uh, it's an area that we see needs a lot of improvement moving forward. So there will definitely be some follow up videos in the future. Um, but for now, I hope it at least unblocks some people and gives them some more understanding about how they can actually, you know, write um, temporal applications reliably. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.